In this seminar, I'm going to elaborate on how to image molecular interactions in cells by using first resonance energy transfer. So the way this seminar is set up is as follows. I will start off with the principles of first resonance energy transfer. I will then discuss the relevant parameters that are important to, to, to measure specific molecular interactions. I'm going to discuss shortly good fluorescent protein pairs to measure energy transfer to infer interaction. And then I'm going to discuss approaches to actually image FRET with a microscope. And there's a specific order over here where I start off with the least quantitative, but the easiest way of measuring as we move on becomes more complicated, but as well we get more quantitative information about molecular interactions in cells. So the idea of using first resonance energy transfer to measure molecular interaction is based on detecting coincidence of molecules. Normally where you do or you want to detect interactions of molecules in let's say biochemical experiment, you pull down one of the molecules and you look what comes along. So it's kind of a direct measure of interaction. In this case we basically look at interaction or infer interaction by coincidence in space. Now you can do that with a microscope and in the problem with the normal uh, wide field microscope is that in a way the diffraction limits are absorber volume element. So a typical volume element that you can resolve with a wide field microscope is in the order of a femtoliter, which corresponds to approximately a micron cube. Of course the entities that we're detecting or the entities we want to know if they interact have a way smaller volume. They're in the order of a zeptoliter or subzeptoliter, so in the order of 10 to the minus 22 liters. So we have seven orders of magnitude difference in these scales. Now you can use co-localization to infer interaction, but the probability that you have an interaction when you see co-localization is very low. So how can we improve it and how can we use FRET to actually decrease this detection volume? So first let me discuss what FRET really is. So first a resonance energy transfer is a non-radiative transfer and the word non-radiative is important. It's not the trivial emission of a photon and reabsorption by the acceptor. It's a dipole-dipole coupling mechanism, so it's a non-radiative transfer of energy between nearby fluorophores. Now, if you normally excite a donor, let's say with blue light, in this case it's a GFP, it will very quickly relax from a high excited state by interconversion, vibrational relaxation to the first electronic excited state. From there it can do several things, it can go back to the ground state by non-radiative decay, again into conversion, or it can remit a photon. If you have a coupling with an acceptor, dipole-dipole coupling, then you have an extra channel of non-radiative decay which shortens the excited state lifetime. So it means that the acceptor will actually, or sorry, the donor will actually emit less light. So you get a quenching of the donor when threat occurs. At the same time, the acceptor gets excited by this process. Again, it's not the absorption of a photon. So dipole-dipole coupling gets excited and will then start emitting fluorescence. And so you get basically emission from the acceptor because of this process. So what we do is we cannot directly measure FRAT. It's not a direct observable, but we can infer FRAT from a change in the photophysical properties or the emission of the donor or the acceptor. So here are a few relevant parameters that we use to quantify FRET. One of them is actually the FRET efficiency. And the FRET efficiency is basically the number of excited donors that transfer the energy to the acceptor, divided by the number of photons absorbed by the donor. This amounts, of course, to the number of excited donors. So it's basically a fraction of donors that transfer the energy to the acceptor. Now you can also put this in a language of rates. These are transfer rates, second minus one. So here we have basically the ratio between the transfer rate divided by the total rate of de-exciting the donor, which is the transfer rate again plus the sum of non-radiative decay to the ground state and radiative decay to the ground state, or transition to the ground state. The efficiency can be shown to be equal to this ratio where you see two parameters. One is the 
First the radius, R0, it's an important parameter. This represents a distance at which the efficiency is 50%. So half the excited donor molecules transfer to the acceptor. And this is typically in the order of nanometers. Uh, so you get this process where you're in a nanometer range. It also appears over here, but then here we have basically the distance between the donor and acceptor. And you can see it's an R to the sixth dependence, which makes this very steep dependence. So the efficiency is a way of measuring distances between the donor and acceptor. So here I have plotted the first efficiency as a function of distance between the donor and acceptor in units of the first radius. So if you have a first radius or a, a radius of one, uh, we must, must have 50% energy transfer shown over here. The point is as follows, is you have molecules that do not interact, that are basically in solution. The average distance is so large that you cannot get energy transfer. To give you an example, if you have a one micromolar solution, the average distance between molecules is in the order of 100 nanometers, which is about 20 units on this scale. That means you're way off to the right. So there's no way you get energy transfer. However, if you go to a concentration of one millimolar, the average distance becomes already something like 10 nanometers, and we're really getting close to this point over here. However, when we express proteins in cells, we are typically in the order of one to 10 micromolar concentration. And so in solution, that should not be a problem. So we're way off here. So we don't get this trivial flat process, which is due to the concentration, the average distance between molecules. Because of the steep distance dependence, we basically have a situation where non-interaction doesn't give you FRAT and interacting molecules give you FRAT. So these are the parameters that determine R0. And over here, the first factor called kappa square is actually a, a factor that is a geometric factor that is defined by the orientation of the transition moments, the transition dipoles. When two molecules have the transition moments aligned, the process of transfer becomes very efficient and you have a factor of four. However, when they're perpendicular, that factor is basically zero. So you can have a situation where two chromophores are extremely proximal, but they're at right angles with the transition moments, so you don't get FRAT. Now, in general, that factor is taken to be two-thirds where you basically average over all orientations. This means very floppy fluorophores that move in all directions. So you basically, in the time of transfer, you sample all orientations. It can be shown that this factor is then two-thirds. Unfortunately, with fluorescent protein, the chromophore is embedded within the barrel and is quite rigid. And the reorientation of the barrel is rather slow on the time scale of transfer, which means we can actually not do this um, dynamic averaging. It's kind of a static averaging that we get. And so that is a problem and actually that is also a factor that will then inhibit us from using the efficiency to calculate distance between molecules. However, still a change in efficiency in the complex will tell us if there's, for example, a conformational change going on. If you put it to two-thirds, we can actually compare different fluorescent protein pairs in terms of the efficiency of transfer. I'll just make it a constant. The second parameter over here is a refractive index, which for, let's say, cytoplasm is set to 1.4. So that's more or less a constant. We don't worry about it too much. This factor over here is the overlap integral, which represents the resonance principle which is the overlap between the emission of the donor and the absorption of the acceptor. It says how much actually the energy levels are matched. The more they're matched, the better you get the transfer. And it's defined by this integral shown over here, which shows again the fluorescence emission spectrum, the absorption spectrum. So two things to consider here. The extinction coefficient of the acceptor is an important parameter. Just the higher it is, just the more efficient is the transfer. So you want to have molecules, accept the molecules with a high extinction coefficient to increase your R0. It represents the ability of the molecule to absorb photons.
The other factor that's important is the slap to the fourth. So basically the overlap integral becomes higher when you move to the rad part of the spectrum, which means when you're using fluorescent proteins that are more in the rad part of the spectrum, the overlap integral becomes larger and you get a bigger R, R0. Quantum yield is given over here, quantum yield of the donor. The more photons can be emitted from the donor when it's in an excited state, the better the transfer process, and this can be maximally one. So here are some R0 values that I've done for several um, fluorescent proteins that are available at the moment. And I've started off by representing the R0 for the classical pair, the cyan fluorescent protein and the yellow fluorescent protein. This pair was used a lot in the past because we didn't have a choice for other, other uh, fluorescent protein pairs. The R0 is quite moderate, so it's close to five nanometers, um, but nowadays because we can have more red um, emitting fluorophores, uh, we can actually increase our R0 and better detect interactions. Also we have better cyan fluorescent proteins that for example have an increased quantum yield, one of the parameters that was important for R0 and thereby increase um, the R0. So for example this cerulean is a variant of uh, cyan fluorescent protein with the acceptor citrine which is a variant of the yellow fluorescent protein already has a R0 of 5.3. Now if you use for example a citrine as a donor now instead of an acceptor and we have an orange fluorescent protein as an acceptor we go already to almost five and a half nanometers. If you use citrine with a red fluorescent protein as acceptor we go close to six nanometers. These pairs are typically pairs that we use at the moment to actually detect threat, especially this one over here, so citrine and cherry, because they have very good folding properties and, and therefore it's very good to measure interactions in cells, and R0 close to 6 nanometers. So back to our coincidence detection, so if you just measure coincidence of molecules by co-localization using a microscope, our detectable volume element is way too large as compared to the volume of the proteins we're detecting. If you now look at the coincidence of molecules using FRET, we're going to a volume that is in the same order as the volume of the molecules that we want to detect. So we're in this sub zeptoliter um, domain or sub zeptoliter scale uh, for an R0, for example, 4.6 nanometers. Now, important point to make here, FRET is not a technique to improve resolution. It's not like a super resolution technique. It gives you a signal about how many molecules in a volume element are actually interacting. It's proportional to the amount of molecules that are interacting. That's an important point to make. So no increase of resolution. So what do we actually measure when we quantify FRET? So different approaches, but in fact we measure an apparent efficiency. And this apparent efficiency equals the real efficiency, transfer efficiency, which is only defined for the complex. So there where you have FRET. And that is actually a geometric parameter, it gives information about distances and angles. In a way it's a measure of the conformation of the molecule. The apparent efficiency is also proportional to the fraction of interacting molecules at each volume element. And that's really an image. So here we can look at reaction progression. So how many molecules, how many molecules are interacting at this specific volume element, for example, over here, as compared to over here. Now, this is actually the biologically relevant parameter, which is a local parameter which gives us a real map. Versus the efficiency, the efficiency is not a local parameter, it's actually a global parameter, which only is defined by properties of the molecule. I'll come back to that property. So before I elaborate on the different approaches to measure FRET in a microscope, there's one important point to consider, which is the shape of the spectra. So when you look at absorption spectra, they always tail towards the blue part of the spectrum and are steep at the red part of the spectrum. That is typical. When you look at emission spectra, so fluorescence emission spectra, they do exactly the opposite. They're very steep at the blue part of the spectrum, but that tail towards the red. And that's why we can specifically excite the acceptor 
Uh, you can see we can excite the acceptor without exciting the donor, but we cannot excite the donor without exciting the acceptor. And similarly, we can specifically detect the donor without detecting the acceptor, but not specifically detect the acceptor without detecting the donor. So these two specific excitation of the acceptor, specific detection of the donor, is relevant what I'm going to elaborate on when we talk about the measurements to get FRET, um, to a FRET measurement in a microscope. So this is the most straightforward and simple approach which has been used a lot in the past. It's purely based on the fact that if you have FRET, you quench the donor, but you increase the intensity of the acceptor by sensitized emission. So you excite the acceptor by this process. So what you do is you excite the donor and you measure the donor image, so a donor emission image, and you measure an acceptor emission yeah, by exciting the donor. And then you simply have two images which you ratio in this way. Yeah, so donor excitation, acceptor emission, donor excitation, donor emission. Now, because we have the problem that we still have direct excitation of the acceptor and we have bleed through of the donor, this only works when a donor and acceptor are in the same molecule, so in the same polypeptide. Now, you need to keep the stoichiometry of donor and acceptor constant in each pixel. So this specifically works, for example, for sensors like the chameleon that measure a change in a physiological parameter like calcium, but it can also measure phosphorylation. Again, I will give an example of that. So here we have a construct which you can me measure in a ratio-metric way. So it's epidermal growth factor receptor, its other name is RBB1, where we have now in one chain a donor, CFP, we have a PTB domain that specifically recognizes phosphotyrosines, and we have a yellow fluorescent protein as an acceptor. Realize that even in whatever conformation it is, you might already have basal FRET. You only see a change in the configuration, so a change in the FRET efficiency. So this measurement gives you, in a way, a relative measure of the conformation of the molecule. So it's very easily implemented. You can do it on, 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 on very different type of setups, like confocal setup or wide field imaging with the right filter sets. It's very fast because you just need to acquire two images. It's not quantitative, you can only measure differences in state. And you need to keep the stoichiometry of donor and acceptor constant, which basically means that they have to be in the same construct. Here's just an, an example of how such an experiment looks like. So we have expressed this construct in COS7 cells. You see the fluorescence of YFP over here, where you see the distribution of the receptor. It's actually on membranes, but also on vesicles inside. And here we measure what happens when you add EGF, so you activate the receptor. The blue represents the phosphorylated receptor. So you see basically there's an area in the cytoplasm that shows active receptor, but there's also an area in the cytoplasm which represents inactive receptor, where it becomes inactivated. So here we can actually, and then at the end of the sequence, we actually inhibit the kinase activity and the whole thing shoots back up um, because we um, inhibit the kinase activity which cannot then self phosphorylate or autophosphorylate. So let's move one step further and try to use a measurement now which is slightly more quantitative than this approach and where we can actually use the donor and acceptor on separate proteins. So this is the approach of sensitized emission. Now, in an ideal situation, if we could excite the donor specifically yeah, without exciting the acceptor and we would monitor the fluorescence of the acceptor, we would only get emission from the acceptor when there's energy transfer. Yeah, so we would basically make an image where we excite the donor and detect the acceptor. The problem, of course, is that we're directly exciting the acceptor and we have bleed through of the donor in the acceptor channel. So the image where you excite the donor and you look at the acceptor doesn't equate to the sensitized emission. We have contamination from direct excitation and bleed through. Now before I elaborate a little bit further, look at the form of the spectra 
we cannot really look in our example where we have donor and acceptor, we cannot really determine how much acceptor comes through. However, what we can do is we can measure the amount acceptor by exciting it directly at its peak, because there we don't excite the donor. So that's very specific. So if you somehow would know the, let's say, the, the ratio between these two, which is a fixed number, then we could actually determine by measuring here how much is there. Exactly the same situation with the, with the, with the donor bleed through. We cannot measure in a sample where we have donor and acceptor because we have the emission of the acceptor. But we can measure the donor specifically. So if again, we would know that relationship, this ratio, by measuring here, we could determine how much is there, as long as the spectra, the shape, is invariant. So how do we do this correction? How do we determine these correction factors? We take a sample with the donor alone and determine basically the ratio, sorry, the ratio between this and this, and we take a sample with the acceptor alone and we take the ratio between this and this. And thereby, by measuring in a sample where we have donor acceptor, for example, at the, by exciting the acceptor, we can determine how much we directly excite the acceptor. So this is how the experiment goes. We express the donor in this case, are we going to correct for bleed through? We excite the donor, we just now have the donor spectrum because there's no acceptor, and measure at the emission of the acceptor. Now in, order, in other words, to, to, to correct in the sample where we have donor and acceptor, we need to know how this relates to this intensity, and so we measure at the peak of the donor. And now, by this ratio, we have the scalar correction factor, it's a scalar, by which we need to correct the image where we excite the donor and measure the donor in order to subtract it from the sensitized emission or the, the FRAT channel. Very similar principle for correction for direct excitation. We take now a sample which contains the acceptor alone. In the sample that we have donor and acceptor, we cannot determine how much is there because there's also the donor. So we measure in a sample where we have donor acceptor this part. However, we need to know how much is there, so we need to obtain the ratio. And it's exactly the same situation. So we basically have a scalar correction factor where we take an image with the acceptor alone, we excite the donor, that's the, where we have the, the direct excitation, and measure at the acceptor divided by the image of direct excitation of the acceptor and measurement at the acceptor. And so then the sensitized emission is built up as follows. We have our donor excitation and acceptor emission. In the ideal world, that would be the sensitized emission. However, we have the contributions from the donor bleed through and the acceptor direct excitation. Because we can measure the donor in a sample that contains both donor and acceptor, specifically at the donor wavelength, we get a measure of this bleed through which we need to correct by the scalar factor. Exactly the same situation for direct excitation of the acceptor. So we have basically, we take three images, we take the donor excitation, acceptor emission, donor excitation, donor emission, acceptor excitation, acceptor emission. And then in a separate experiments we determine these two scalar factors. When we divide this by the acceptor intensity, so exciting the acceptor and acceptor emission, we get a measure of the apparent efficiency that is proportional, proportional to the real efficiency and the fraction of interacting molecules. So this is very easy implemented on standard microscopes. You can do it in a confocal microscope, you can do it in a wide field microscope with appropriate filter sets. It's rather fast, because you can switch all your filter sets very, or your filters very quickly on a filter wheel or in a confocal microscope. You can almost do it simultaneously, or you can do it simultaneously. It's semi-quantitative because you get something that's proportional to the relative concentration of interacting molecules. The problem here is, of course, it depends on these external calibrations, so to get these scalar factors where you need a sample with donor alone and acceptor alone, that makes it also very sensitive to noise. 
And one important other property that you need to have is that the spectra are basically invar invariant to the uh, uh, environment, so that they don't change their, their shapes dependent uh, on the environment. For example, if it's a lipid environment or in a cytoplasmic environment. That is the case with fluorescent proteins, fortunately, because the chromophore is encased in the barrel. So the environment is defined by the barrel. So an example here, again, we use the same system. We have epidermal growth factor receptor now attached with a donor. We have now the separate expression of this PTB domain that recognizes this phosphotyrosine tagged with the acceptor. Because we make the corrections, we can have them in separate, as separate constructs. We don't need to attach them. So here's basically the row that represents the distribution in space of the receptor. Here we have the PTB domain, and here we have the apparent efficiency. Now this is a very simple experiment, basically no stimulation. You can see that there's already active receptor, there's already interaction over here. When we add EGF, we get an increase of interaction, we get more receptors activated. When we add an inhibitor of the kinase, at short times it still stay on because the phosphatase takes some time to actually dephosphorylate the receptor, but at longer times we actually lose that interaction again. So this is the third intensity-based approach that Con described, that from the intensity-based approach is the most quantitative. But it has a big disadvantage as compared to the previous method I was describing. You can only use it in fixed cells, so it's very difficult to do in life, in life systems. The advantage of this approach is that it's very robust and it's quite quantitative. So how does this work? It's as follows. We excite the donor and then look at the emission of the donor. If FRET goes on, the donor should be quenched. And so there's less emission from it because it's an extra channel of non-radiative decay. What we would like to know is what is the donor intensity in the absence of acceptor? Because that allows us very easily to calculate the efficiency. Now, we cannot do a separate experiment where we measure the donor alone because it would be a completely different configuration, different concentration of molecules and so on. So what we do is the following. We excite the acceptor, which we can do highly specifically, and basically excite it until it's gone. We photobleach it completely. So we destroy the acceptor antenna. And then, after that, we re-measure re the donor. And then, the donor will unquench, the intensity will go up, and you have the situation in the absence of the acceptor. Of course, in a live cell situation where things move very fast, it is not possible. Well, you'll change the interactions, you'll change where molecules are, and then this is not anymore a good measure. That's why you want to do this in fixed cells. Now, the apparent efficiency is basically one minus the donor in the situation where you have the acceptor, that's quenched, and then the donor in the situation where you have photobleached the acceptor. Now, this is what it looks like in a, in a real experiment. Here again we have the same system, just to make this comparison, so we have again epidermal growth factor receptor, and in this case we look actually at the phospho phosphorylation of the tyrosines by using an antibody that has a, a chemical uh, acceptor. As a small tag as an acceptor. This is in fixed cells. As I said before, photobleaching or acceptor photobleaching is, is, is best done in fixed cells, very difficult to do it in live cells. And um, we basically have incubated with this antibody. Now, the point here is that this antibody is not specific for uh, EGFR phosphotyrosines, it also recognizes any phosphotyrosine. However, because we measure the proximity of this antibody to this molecule with FRAT, we get a highly specific signal for the phosphorylation of the receptor specifically for that receptor. So here you have basically the donor alone, that's the distribution of the receptor. Here below is the acceptor distribution, it's the antibody, it's there where you have phosphorylation. And then we photobleach in this rectangle. The acceptor, you can see it disappeared over here. We did this in a confocal microscope, so we just took an area, a region of interest, we photobleach it over there, this becomes then the reference region. And then what you see in the donor is actually you see an increase in the intensity there where you had FRET. Uh, if you compare this situation over here, for example, to the situation over here. It's also very nicely seen in this image where you have the difference between these two. Uh, so you see basically unquenching, whereas in the reference region there's hardly anything going on. Now, if you take one minus this image divided by that image, 
you get the apparent threat efficiency, which shows that we have active receptors mostly at the plasma membrane and very little active receptors on these um, internal vesicles. So basically it's just dephosphorylated in this, in this compartment. So this approach is very easily implemented. It's highly robust, it's actually used almost as a standard to prove that threat is going on. It's very slow and that is the biggest disadvantage, so it's not suitable for live cell imaging. There is possibly a, a solution here by using photochromic dyes or switchable dyes that you can switch back and forth on and off to do it in live cells, but I'm not going to discuss that. It's semi-quantitative, but you get something that's proportional to the fraction of complex times the true efficiency. So it's in that sense the most quantitative in terms of the intensity-based methods. And you don't need an external calibration as was the case, for example, for sensitized emission measurements. Uh, you have an internal control by this bleaching. So one more example that I show over here just to show you that you can use this approach to, um, to also, for example, do a three-dimensional map of interaction. In this case, we looked at the interaction between epidermal growth factor and a phosphatase called PTP1B that's on the surface of the ER. And we use a specific trapping mutant that has a stable interaction with its substrates. And so we wanted to know where does the phosphatase actually act on the epidermal growth factor. So what you do is you take a donor stack, so you take a complete stack to obtain a three-dimensional distribution of your donor. You then photobleach the acceptor by just scanning over one plane because the dose effect of photobleaching just needs to stay in one place, at least in, in one photon approaches. You photobleach the acceptor completely, then you retake the three-dimensional stack and you just take one minus the, the ratio of these two images and you obtain the apparent efficiency map. And now you can see in this green area basically where these interactions take place. So you can clearly see that that's the place where um, the receptor gets dephosphorylated basically inside the cell. So this is the last approach I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to describe and I'm going to elaborate more on the second seminar which deals specifically with it because it's the most quantitative approach but also involves a little bit more, um, let's say, technical um, um, appro uh, um, uh, equipment, it, it, more, more elaborate equipment but also uh, elaborate analysis methods and it's worth discussing it separately. The major strength is really quantification. So measuring threat by fluorescence lifetime imaging microscopy, what we do here, we measure the excited state lifetime of the donor. So you excite the donor and you measure the donor, which you can do specifically uh, without seeing the acceptor. And instead of measuring the intensity, what we do is we measure the excited state decay as a function of time. And if you have threat, you have an extra channel of non-radiative decay, so you depopulate the excited state faster, and that means you will always get a shorter or a, a more rapid decay, which means a shorter, shorter lifetime. Now, just to give you a flavor of um, what it looks like, I just have an example here, which I will come back to in my second seminar, where we looked at the interaction between RAS, which is the central node in signal transduction, which has the donor molecule citrin attached to it, and this molecule called PD delta, which is a GDI like solubilizing factor with a cherry attached to it. Now we were interested in this interaction because it was of importance to the spatial organization of RAS and we needed to know where this interaction takes place inside cells. So we basically measure FRET and we do this specifically by measuring the excited state properties of the, of the donor. Now what we obtain with FLIM in a single experiment is the true efficiency, the true efficiency in the complex, which is a geometric parameter that is space invariant, is only a property of the complex, which allows us to say something about its conformation. If you take out kappa square, we ignore kappa square, we can actually say that because we have a 50% energy transfer efficiency that we have an approximate distance of six nanometers. But that is very dangerous. More important, and that is really relevant for biologists in my opinion, is this parameter alpha, which is the fraction of interacting molecules in each pixel or spatially resolvable volume element. This represents reaction progression. Where does interaction take place? And this is a truly a map as con in contrast to E, which is not a map. That's just a scalar. It's a property of the complex. This is a property that varies as a function of space. Uh, so here we get then the fraction, in a false color table, a fraction of molecules 
that are interacting, in this case RAS interacting with PD delta. You can see, for example, here that at the plasma membrane we do not find interaction, and at the Golgi we do not find interaction, whereas we clearly see interaction in the cytoplasm. And this was highly relevant to couple, let's say, the state of RAS to its interaction with PD delta. So next time I'm going to elaborate on this fluorescence lifetime imaging microscopy because it deserves a separate um, um, discussion because it's the most quantitative of the approaches and allows you to do quantitative biology and better understand how molecular reactions, um, for example, um, are important for spatial organization.